Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us all again for another virtual classroom uh, as we all keep, you know, learning and working from home. Uh, today's uh, virtual class is one that I'm pretty excited about. It's sort of the, especially because it's kind of the, the uh, meat and potatoes of what we do here at OSEARCH, so to speak. Um, and it has to do with solving what we refer to as uh, the Northwest Atlantic White Shark Puzzle. Uh, today's presentation um, is brought to you uh, and presented by um, Burke Kanani Jewelry and Ocean Family Games. Uh, awesome, awesome products from both of them. Burke Kanani makes fabulous, beautiful uh, jewelry, all having to do with uh, the ocean. Uh, she even has a special O Search line. And Ocean Family Games lets you get games and save the ocean all at the same time. So, huge thank you to Brooke Kanani and Ocean Family Games. Um, today, our uh, presenter is Lindsay Lochner. She's an OSEARCH Education Ambassador. Uh, she's been with us for two, since about 2015, I think. Right, Lindsay? That's right. Cool, yeah. She's been on the ship. More <laughs> positions, maybe, even than I have. So, uh, huge thank you to Lindsay and everything that she does. Um, so she's put together this course for everybody today. And like I said, it has to do with the Northwest Atlantic white shark puzzle. And so with that, I'll kind of turn it over to Lynn. Oh, one quick thing, everybody. We do have a um, comment section uh, right below this, uh, the video where you can leave questions. We will try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, I do ask that we try to keep the questions related to the topic at hand. Uh, we won't have time to answer everybody's question, but the more on topic the question is, the better chance it is of it getting answered by uh, Lindsay during the presentation. Also, please keep the comments uh, related to what's going on um, instead of distracting comments. Um, also, uh, we, it was just brought to our attention that some of you may have received the wrong course material, but you can download both of the sheets that you'll need uh, in the little download button right directly above this video. Um, you can download those and follow along with Lindsay's plan. Uh, so with that, Lindsay, I will turn it over to you uh, to discuss the white shark, the Northwest Atlantic white shark puzzle and why that is so incredibly exciting. Perfect. Thank you so much, John, for that wonderful introduction. Hello, everybody. It's so nice to spend some time with you today. Thank you so much for joining us and for your support. We hope that you are staying well. And today, like John said, we are going to be talking about the Northwest Atlantic White Shark Project and the materials that you'll want to use or the, the curriculum or activities that we'll be using today include the North Atlantic White Shark Inquiry page where you can follow along as I chat about the North Atlantic White Shark Project and uh, go ahead and fill in that sheet as we go. Or you can also download the other activity that's included for free where you can actually cut out the puzzle that uh, we created around Una Maki's track who we'll talk about today and see how all these pieces uh, fit together um, in order to learn about the life stages and life history of the Northwest Atlantic white shark. So that's uh, what we'll be doing today. And with that, I think we should just go ahead and dive right on into it. So you might be asking, what is the North Atlantic white shark puzzle? Well, it's the research that we're doing in the Northwest Atlantic about white sharks. It started in 2012 when OSEARCH went to Cape Cod, Massachusetts to start to gather data that we did not have about white sharks in the Atlantic. And you might say, well, why white sharks? Why not choose a different species of shark? Well, white sharks are very important to the health of the ocean. They are apex predators. They are maintaining the balance of the ocean. If we were to lose our sharks or lose white sharks out of the Northwest Atlantic, you would see consequences. You would see populations of different animals increase, which would affect other tiers of the food chain. And the, what, the vocabulary word that you would see is a trophic cascade where the pieces of the chain fall apart and you don't have, you no longer have a healthy ocean. White sharks are not only eating healthy animals too, they're also taking care of other populations like dead, dying, or sick animals. And when they feed on those kind of animals, it keeps them from reproducing, right? Which leads to healthier populations. 
So that's really important. They are, they are maintaining all of that balance. And we know that we're losing around 275,000 sharks every day to things like unsustainable fishing practices with bycatch. Sometimes they're taken for their squalene liver oil. Their liver is very important for buoyancy in the ocean. Unfortunately, they can be, the oil from sharks can be found in different products that we buy. So it's important for us to be uh, informed consumers and think about what we're buying and what's in them. Um, as well as uh, shark fin soup and other reasons why sharks are being taken out of the ocean. So at 275,000 sharks a day, that's around 100 million sharks a year. And what's interesting about white sharks is they are slow to mature. They take about 20 years to reach maturity where they can go and have baby white sharks, pups that we'll be talking about later. And they also will have only seven to 13 pups at a time. And when you are reproducing at that kind of rate, if your populations feel any pressure, that wouldn't be very good because you couldn't maintain the balance by replacing, if you will, the, the population of the white shark at, at that rate. So we have to learn about all the life stages of the, of the white shark in order to manage it in the ocean to, toward abundance and to a healthy state. So that's why, that's why white sharks. And the, pu the puzzle is bringing these different pieces together using the tracking data from the OSEARCH Global Tracker and doing a health assessment, which will go into the different parts of the health assessment. So here are the different life stages that our scientists are studying in order to get a clear picture of what the life of the North Atlantic white shark is like from birth until maturity. So your first uh, stage is your young of the year stage, that pup stage that has a young of the year uh, white shark there. Uh, we will talk about the studies that we did about the young of the year uh, nursery in the North Atlantic. And that sample size was about 20 uh, white sharks for that study. And then we have sub-adult animals, which are that stage after that are juveniles and now they're like teenagers and are going on into that last stage where they reach maturity. And that's what we were talking about around that 20 year age mark. They're able to reproduce and have pups and uh, keep the balance of the ocean maintained in all of those life stages it takes to have a healthy ocean, right? So those are the different ages and those are the different stages we'll be referring to when we're looking into different research projects. All right, we're going to be able to do now around 17 to 19, I believe, research projects in 15 minutes or less before that shark is tagged and released. And so I look forward to sharing what some of those projects are as this the pieces of the puzzle start to come together. All right, so let me show you what we knew about white sharks when we first started the Northwest Atlantic White Shark Project in 2012. Look at that tracking data. Oh my goodness, we didn't have any pings going on, did we? That's because we just did not have them. Uh, this was pioneering work uh, done by OSEARCH in Cape Cod in 2012. And at that time, there, that expedition led to the tagging of four white sharks that you may recognize the names of. And this is in your... Uh, your inquiry page, so you can go ahead and write them down along with me. I'll try and say them nice and slow. We had Jeannie, Betsy, Catherine, and Mary Lee. So those were the first four sharks that we tagged. What we're looking for in this puzzle are we're looking for the mating site, the birthing site, and where they're uh, eating or foraging, where they're taking advantage of those foraging opportunities. So this is the very beginning of seeing the mating site, birthing site, and foraging and life history of the North Atlantic white shark puzzle start to come together. It started with those four sharks. And Mary Lee was a great shark to tag and is one of our uh, legacies uh, that we have at OSEARCH because she is a mature female, so she's gonna be able to hopefully show us at some point uh, what that mature uh, track is like, as they were some of the first tracks of Northwest Atlantic white sharks, and maybe where the mating site, the or birthing site, and some of those foraging areas are. 
So with that, let's go ahead and see a video about Mary Lee to learn more. Real quick, everybody, I just want to let you know I am making note of your questions. One question, uh, and I will try and get to them at the end of the presentation. One of them that I uh, did want to ask real quick, Lindsay, um, right now, because it's been asked a couple of times, is why, sure. do you, why are people killing sharks? Why are people killing sharks? So they're killing sharks because they are um, for a fish for commercial fishing. They're as part of bycatch. They are caught for squalene or their liver oil to put into products. Um, at some time, there had been trophies that um, people had fished them for jaws and teeth and other things. And and sharks are also fished out of the ocean for fins, unfortunately. Okay, and now now to the video. So I just wanted to let everybody know that I am watching for your questions um, and I will ask if it's appropriate to interrupt Lindsay, I will do that. Otherwise, I'm gonna try and save them all to the end. Like I said, if the more on topic your question is, the better chance it is that I'll be able to ask Lindsay about it in the end or during the presentation, so. Head that way. All right, what do you think? The best way between radios and lights is coming from crazy. She's turning at you, Brian. Yeah, Graham, we are uh, all green here. We are a full go. Nice big building that you want to think about. Please, my dear. What's that, boy? So the pings that you see right here, this is the track that we'll be referring to about Mary Lee. These pings are a result of having a spot tag that was placed on her dorsal fin. It has a five-year battery life, and when her fin comes up and out of the water for about 30 seconds, there are two copper points on the tag. The um, That connection is severed, waking up the battery and the computer that's within that tag, and then it sends three consecutive pings to a satellite which it results in the pings that you see here, those points on the Osearch Global Tracker. So you are tracking these sharks at the same time that our scientists are in near real time. It updates about every 30 minutes, which is really great. So that's what we're referring to when we talk to pings. These are, this is the, the track from her spot tag. And when we see Mary Lee's track, there's a lot of points, ping points in there, but what's really, interesting is when you see her use this open ocean area we saw her using the southeast here in the united states and around what we think could be birthing season for white sharks based on research done that was done in the pacific ocean on white sharks we knew birthing season was around may june kind of time frame and we saw mary lee go up into the Hudson River area, that uh, North New York Bight area, and ping in there, and then uh, head out uh, further out to sea. And we went, oh, wow, that's really interesting. Because we also had a scientist at that time, Dr. Toby Curtis, who has also seen some young of the year or pup white sharks during that same time frame, and said, hey, let's, is it possible for us to do? an expedition in this area and take a look at these young of the year white sharks so we can understand that life history. Like we said before, these young of the year white sharks are four to seven feet long at birth. They're completely able to be independent and swimming on their own. But what's kind of interesting, uh, kind of a fun fact about them is that their teeth aren't the, quite exactly the same shape as the sub-adult or mature white sharks because they're eating different things, maybe. 
than their uh, older counterparts are, but that's all part of that health assessment. We want to know all that we can about these young of the year white sharks. We're, so we're giving them a health check, looking at their blood work, looking at their tagging data, looking at um, bacteria levels, ultrasound, doing all kinds of projects that are safe to do on these white sharks, and then looking at their movement so we can establish a nursery in the Northwest Atlantic, hopefully. Couple of quick questions here, Lindsay, that I do think makes sense right now. Sure. One, does the tagging hurt the shark? And two, how can you tell if it's a baby? Ah, well, you can tell if it's a baby because of its size mostly. That's a, a really good estimate of the age of a white shark or about any shark is its size in relation to what its overall length will be when it's an adult. So when you see a young of the year that looks like a, a mini, adult white shark and you're looking at identifying that species and then look at size, that's how you, about how you know what age it is. And I'm sorry, what was the other question? Does tagging the, the shark hurt them? Ah, it does not hurt the shark. So what's, uh, so their dorsal fin, that's that top fin there on the back, on along their back. They don't have a lot of nerve endings, if any at all, in there. So if you were to touch your earlobe right here, like I am, and kind of give it a little squeeze, that's what they're feeling. They might feel some pressure, but you're not going to feel a whole lot of pain. Plus, that tag has the ability to fall off after a certain period of time. And these young of the year white sharks had some tags that were designed to help them uh, with, their aer with their hydrodynamics as they swim. And they, are, they only have a two-year battery life instead of a five year, because that's all the information we needed was about two years uh, from those, uh, from the sample size, so. Okay, let's uh, go to the quick, uh, move the little video here. Research. It might be the smallest white shark ever to tag in history. And that, you know, if, the, if you believe the birthing site is May or June, that means that, that fish could have been as little as two months old. This is clearly a much older fish than the one we captured last night. It'll be interesting to see what the science say if they think it was just one a little earlier this year, or perhaps this is a one year old fish or a two year old fish. We'll have to dig into the science a little bit to understand that. It's significantly bigger than the one last night, which is clearly a young of the year. And this is a male. This is the first male shark we've caught, and I believe it will be spot tagged in North Atlantic history. We have six females, white sharks tagged, and this will be the very first male. So now we wait. We let the shark wake up. We have to let them spit the hose out of their mouth on their own because the hose is pushing the water through their gills right now. So when it's underwater, it creates like a venturi and it's like this really great flow. Now they're swimming. What a swimmer. Fantastic. There he goes. Yeah, Hudson. Good luck on the way. There he goes. Oh, excellent. Swim strong. Yeah. Where are you facing from? Very well done.
So that research and those health assessments that were done on those young of the year white sharks, sharks that are up to about a year old, uh, that research is being used not only to see where their movements are uh, it, within the nursery for the North Atlantic white shark, but also they're doing uh, health assessments and it's being used to inform policy as well. It's important to be able to manage these young of the years, which are uh, susceptible possibly to um, acti fishing activities and human impact in the ocean. So we also want to use research to inform policy and conservation. Uh, for this species. So you can see here the track, there's the young of the year pup on the left, and then you can see on the right the track. And what do you notice? We're thinking like scientists today, right? So what do you notice about the tracks of this young of the year shark? This is gurney. Well, what I noticed about a uh, gurney's track was that Gurney spent a lot of time there in that New York bite area, the area between Montauk, New York, off of Long Island, uh, and down to New Jersey, but then stayed around where North Carolina is to about Wilmington, North Carolina. And um, a lot of our Young of the Year white sharks made a similar track. They were staying within that range. And that's been a really interesting part of the study to see where they were staying, but uh, quite a few of them stayed in that range. And then the ones that seemed to be older in that study did go ahead and go farther south after that first year or two. Uh, but it's interesting to see why, why do you think they probably do that? How, why is that uh, advantageous to a white shark to stay uh, in that part of the Northwest Atlantic when you're young like that. We'll have to see. So that was the Young of the Year white shark study uh, that we did for two years off Montauk, New York. I believe the scientists were saying that that could have been up to a five-year study, and they were able to complete that sample size because of the collaborative efforts of the fishing team and the science team and complete that in two years instead of five. And that's really fantastic because we want to learn at a fast rate so we can enable uh, change and policy and conservation. So now uh, that we've taken a look at Mary Lee's track, she's a mature female, and we've taken a look at young of the year tracks now. She led us to the white shark nursery in the Northwest Atlantic. We also had this shark then in 2013. This is Lydia. Look at the area that she's maintain maintaining the balance of in the Northwest Atlantic. She was uh, tagged off Jacksonville, Florida, and she made this amazing journey going up to Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, Labrador, crossing the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, going down past the West Azores of Africa, and then pinging in around Charleston, South Carolina in those first couple of years in her track. I think by the time that her tag stopped pinging in, she was around 45,000 mile journey. That's amazing. Our scientists knew that white sharks were highly migratory, but this is amazing to see the distance that she traveled. And she's also showing us an interesting area, wondering, is this something that's going to continue as a pattern as we continue to tag mature females uh, by looking at that uh, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland Labrador area? Or was this an outlier? Do any of you know what an outlier in a data set is? It is something that says, is this something that's uncommon that we won't see again that's completely different than the rest of the information that we have? And so we'll see as we start to talk more about uh, how she fits into the puzzle as well. So we have mature females. We're hoping to then get mature males because where you see female tracks and male tracks overlap, you can hopefully find a mating site. And we already talked about the Northwest Atlantic White Shark Nursery. So this is one of our first mature males that we were able to tag. Going back to Mary Lee's track, she led us, we talked about her coming down to the southeast of the United States around Florida and Georgia, especially Savannah, Georgia area, some of my favorite places to go and visit. 
uh, turns out Mary Lee loved spending some time there too. I and mean, we wonder why she was spending so much time there. So there were some expeditions that are being done, still being done uh, in that region. It started as Expedition Jacks and then went into low country expeditions, but it was that same region. And Hilton, a mature male uh, white shark was tagged. So you now have male set, that data set and a mature female data set. And let's take a look at where Hilton went. Hilton made a really interesting coastal track along the coast of the United States, even went on to the Gulf uh, side of the Gulf of Mexico of Florida, which is really interesting. And then also made his way where, where we saw Lydia's track just a moment ago. He also went to Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, Labrador. Hmm. I wonder what that means. We might, we'll have to discuss that uh, some more as we go on, along today. But let's see what we are learning about the region where we found Hilton first, all right? Because this is an important part of the puzzle too. Let's learn about the North Atlantic shared foraging area. One of the really fascinating things about working here in, in the southeast is, uh, you know, the sharks that we tag here have really uh, led us to new discoveries, uh, mainly with, with places that um, we didn't really understand that these sharks used or used uh, all that frequently. Uh, the first one for us was Lydia, and was the first shark on the tracker anyway to venture into the line of Canadian waters. But at the time, you know, we weren't sure if that was an outlier or not. And then came Hilton, uh, named after Hilton Head, South Carolina. And Hilton really showed us the area of Nova Scotia, um, using that area multiple years in a row, uh, potentially showing another summer habitat for the population. And then, you know, continuing the pattern, last year we were able to tag Brunswick in this region and, and Brunswick showed us yet another area by kind of looping around Nova Scotia and venturing uh, off the coast of New Brunswick up in Canada. So, you know, as it seems that most of the population during the, the winter months uh, come down into this region, you know, it's really important for us because we can sample um, sharks that are potentially from anywhere in the population uh, because they are concentrating in this region as the waters cool further north. Any new shark that we tag in this region, you know, has the potential of, of leading us to new areas and to new discoveries. So you might be wondering, how are we able to tell a maturity in a male white shark, how are we able to tell if uh, white sharks are in this region for foraging or whether they're getting ready to mate or how, how are we able to tell these kinds of things? We're gathering information also during the health assessment. So we're looking at the tracking data, but we're also looking at these health assessments. And one of the pieces of the health assessment is doing blood work, looking at stress levels in the shark, making sure that they are not stressed uh, during the course of the tagging and ass health assessment process. And we're also able to look at the plasma within their blood and take a look at their hormone levels and kind of get an idea of what their hormone levels are like during the course of a year when we do expeditions at different times of the year to see how they're changing and seeing when they might be ready uh, to mate, as well as looking at sperm. You'll see all kinds of really cool health assessments here coming up soon. But these are white sharks that we're tracking right now in the Northwest Atlantic shared foraging area. We think this uh, area is being used for feeding grounds for these white sharks. You have uh, different zones where you have different prey items available to white sharks throughout the year. You have a lot of marine mammals in the north, and we saw during uh, one of our expeditions that we'll talk about that they are feeding on marine mammals in the in like in Nova Scotia or in Cape Cod. And then you have a uh, sport fish uh, like redfish and drum and uh, 
different kinds of sport fish in this region. And are they feeding on those or are they feeding on marine mammals too? What is, what is going on with this foraging piece of the Northwest Atlantic shared foraging area? So we're looking at these sharks and noticing quite a few of them are here in that Northwest Atlantic shared foraging area. And it'll be interesting to follow these. Uh, these are uh, sharks that were tagged in Nova Scotia. And we'll go ahead and see in the video how that piece of the puzzle has started to come together. But this is Una Amaki's track. See, she was there uh, in the uh, NASFA region. And then she went ahead and pinged in along into the uh, Gulf of Mexico side of Florida too. So she uh, is also teaching us a whole lot about that mature uh, shark track. So let's go ahead and do the talk about the video here and learn about our white sharks in Nova Scotia, what we're learning about them, because now we've had Lydia lead us there. Catherine actually went up there too from Cape Cod Expedition. And uh, now Hilton has led us up there as well. So let's take a look at what's going on with white sharks up in Nova Scotia when we up, went up there this fa past fall and the fall before. We just concluded Expedition Nova Scotia 2019. This trip was game changing. We were able to collect samples from 11 sharks and this is going to change our projects and get us the results we need to do amazing science. It's been tremendous to see what actually happened on this expedition. There are more sharks here than anyone ever dreamed of. Sharks of many different profiles, males and females, young and old, and everything in between. steps are to sit down with DFO, which is Canada's version of NOAA, and put together a long-term plan, a five-year plan, a seven-year plan, to make sure we answer the questions that they need to be answered so that they can manage these large sharks toward abundance. So we followed mature white sharks up to Nova Scotia, asking the quest, asking some questions about their life history. Is this a possible mating site for uh, white sharks in the North Atlantic? What are they doing here? We, As you saw in the video, you saw that there were many different life stages that ended up being up there in Nova Scotia. So we have some uh, research still that's left to do. One of those really important sharks that we were able to tag this past year, though, is Una Amaki. And Una Amaki is amazing. She's one of the biggest sharks that we've tagged, but she's also a mature female. So we're wondering where is her track going to lead us in the puzzle of the North Atlantic white shark? Is she going to lead us to a different area entirely? Is she going to show us a second birthing site in the Northwest Atlantic? I have a lot of questions about what, uh, what Una Maki is going to be able to show us. But what's really cool is to be able to follow her. She went over to the Gulf side of Florida around the DeSoto Canyon. And when these researchers tag our sharks, they're using that spot tag, which we talked about, which is giving location data. But they also put on a, what's called a PSAT tag. It's a pop-up archival satellite tag. And what it does is it records data on their dive profiles by measuring light 
and it can gather information also about temperature and salinity and all those kinds of pieces of information as well to see how she's using this part of uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And we just uh, were started to receive data from that PSAT tag. So we'll be able to answer those scientists will be able to answer those questions hopefully soon. Uh, so you can track Unamaki on the app or on OSEARCH's website and follow along with us as we see where she's gonna show us uh, where these sharks are going next. And then we have some more questions we're asking, right? I just had a couple of my own about the Gulf of Mexico, but you're probably wondering what pieces are left to the North Atlantic white shark puzzle, right? Well, we need to complete a sample size. What's a sample size? Well, it's important for science. Scientists need a certain number of sharks in order to draw conclusions about their hypothesis, hypotheses, in order to draw conclusions about what they're researching, right? So this means that we need about 20 uh, young of the year white sharks, for example, that was the sample size for that study. So we still have white sharks that we need to tag, not because it's a made up number, but because it's a scientific number. It's what our scientists are driving us and telling us what they need in order to be able to get the information they have. If we had just done a study on Mary Lee and said, oh, she must be all the information we needed about the Northwest Atlantic white shark mature female puzzle, it we wouldn't have had Lydia, right? And Lydia showed us a whole nother area that they're using. It's important to have a sample size or a, a certain number of sharks so we can be able to have good science and research in order to complete a study, all right? So that's what we mean by a sample size. We need to complete our sample size for our mature animals and I think also for our sub-adult samples too. Mating sites, what's going on? We still are doing research on the mating site in the Northwest Atlantic Ocean. We have some uh, some interesting uh, in data that's being done. I hope you tune in tomorrow, Wednesday. We have our scientists on a panel who can answer some of your questions if you have questions about a possible mating site in the Northwest Atlantic. But I do know it's an ongoing study where it's still, it's still an area of research that we need to dive into. And last, we're wondering what the region that these sharks are going into, what role they play in that puzzle. So is the Northwest Atlantic shared foraging area only for foraging? Or is there also something else going on there? What about Nova Scotia? These are all still questions that we still need to answer. And we started in 2012, and this is still an ongoing, wonderful project. I think that uh, Chris Fisher, our expedition leader, uh, has been saying that we're hoping to be able to wrap uh, the North Atlantic white shark puzzle up in the next few years. Uh, so these scientists can publish uh, their uh, studies and that would be really wonderful because another part of what we do at OSEARCH is taking that amazing research that our scientists are doing and using it to inform policy or laws or fisheries management and that research is directly connected and integrated into the curriculum along with the OSEARCH Global Tracker. So you are learning about the research projects as we learn about the research projects and hand them on to you because you all are part of the Northwest Atlantic White Shark Puzzle too. You are our future scientists, explorers, and stewards of the ocean. It's going to be you who come up with maybe a cool new tag in order for us to understand better about our different shark species in the ocean. And also what you can do to help sharks is be able to to talk to other people. You can be the educators and share what you know about sharks so other people can care about them and learn about them too. We can be smart consumers and think about what we're buying and where we're buying it from. And we can be a part of the puzzle by helping to use less single use plastic, reducing, reusing, and recycling what we have as well. So while our research is very important, it's also informing policy and education, and you are definitely part of the puzzle too. And so we thank you so much for being a part of this and for learning about this research. And I think with that, 
John, don't you think it's time for some questions? Yeah, I definitely think it's time for some questions. Um, I think well, one of the first ones that I um, will ask and I will answer too. Um, I'm looking for it here. Was how big the, the ship is and how many researchers there are. Well, I can take that one real quick, Lindsay, if you don't mind. Um, the O search is about is a little under 130 feet long, um, and then we support research. We support 18 different research projects uh, that are being con being conducted by 31 different researchers from 22 institutions. So it's this big web where we're connecting people and institutions so that they can work on their own individual projects, but still have the expertise of other researchers if they have a question. Um, and so we, we facilitate all of this collaboration. Uh, Lindsay, another question that many people have asked uh, throughout the comments is, why is there a hose in the shark's mouth? Ah, that is a great question. The reason there's a hose in the shark's mouth is because white sharks are obligate ram ventilators. I know that's a mouthful, but what it means is that when they, they need you to keep swimming in order to breathe usually, but the reason for that is because when they swim, they need water to be pushing, seawater to be pushing through their mouth into their internal gills and out their external gills in order to breathe. Well, the shark is on the lift. So in order to replicate that, we put a saltwater hose in the, in the shark's mouth and we can adjust the size of that hose. So if it's a bigger shark, it's getting more seawater, right? Makes sense. Or a smaller young of the year has a smaller hose. And we make sure that they have nice uh, seawater flowing over their gills. So their uh, gills are nice and oxygenated because they need that push of that water in order to breathe. Another uh, question that, that somebody had, and I think you might be surprised to find the answer to, is how close to shore were the sharks in um, Nova Scotia? You know what? I am not sure how far, how close they were to shore. I know they can get into about five to eight I, feet of water um, well, in I, areas like Cape Cod. Um, Go ahead, John. Well, you were, I guess the question is not necessarily Yes, they can get very close. But maybe can you explain how close to shore we were working in Nova Scotia? Uh, John, can you answer that? I, I'm i not sure. I remember oh, going out oh, and enjoying this. Sure. So uh, one of the question was, how will you mute your mic, Lindsay? Sure. Uh, the question was, how, how close to shore were they in Nova Scotia? And, and you know, we were working within a couple hundred yards of the shore, and that's where we actually tagged the majority of them. So, uh, yeah. The next question, I think, for Lindsay, we've had a lot, and it's in a little bit, a um, little bit off topic, but since so many people asked it, I figure I will ask it here too. How good is a shark's vision? Oh, I love a good shark senses question. Sure, uh, sharks have um, similar structures that people do, but they're mostly seen in contrast. If you wanna learn some more about shark vision, you can check out our a live lesson that we did a couple of weeks ago with Dr. Bob Huter, one of our chief scientists. And we went into detail about how they're able to see, uh, but they're seen mostly in contrast. Another question that's been asked several times um, is how can you tell whether it's a male or female shark? Ah, that is an important question because when you're trying to gather a sample size, you want both males and females, right? So to do that, we have to identify them. So what you have is by the pelvic fin, you either have uh, claspers, which are like two fin-like structures uh, that are in a V that come off the shark. And uh, with females, you don't have those two claspers. So if you see claspers, that they're a male. And if you don't, then if they're absent, then it's a female. And then since we're kind of pretty much running out of time here, we'll make this the last question, but it's a good one to end on. Um, so real quick, what, what are the next steps to solving the puzzle? 
I, I think, and you can help me out with this too, John, is more, we need more research, right? We need to have a few more expeditions in order to gather the data that we need. We need to follow these tracks of sharks like Una Amaki and see how they're similar or different to other patterns that we've seen in the past. We can look at data from hormone studies, from ultrasounds, just gather as much information as we can while uh, being able to fulfill that sample size uh, before we can take a, uh, to finish out our research for uh, foraging sites and mating sites in the Northwest Atlantic. Cool. Well, I do want to thank everybody uh, who joined today's presentation. Um, we are planning on doing more of these uh, so that we can help uh, get people engaged while we're all you know, working and, and um, you know, learning from home right now. Uh, so we are planning to put together several more of these on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, so keep an eye out on all of our social media channels for when those classes will be happening for chances to sign up. Um, and we really, we've been having, I've been having a lot of fun doing these, Lindsay, have you? Yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna keep doing them. Um, so stay tuned, uh, and we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you so much, everybody. We hope you learned a lot today, and we hope to see you again real soon.